There we go. Yay. I think we're there. Good morning, all. <laughs> the technology always surprises us one more time. Somebody obviously changed something in my settings. Um, so today's talk is all about the dry gardening. So this is dry gardening, the vegetable garden, um, with the caveat, of course, that this is Western Oregon, so it may not be relevant for all regions, locations, and sites. Um, we will. I'm happy to take questions live from the audience here. Um, questions in from the audience online. Um, type in the chat bar, please. I have my audio off, so I won't be able to hear you. And uh, we'll respond as best we can in keeping up with both of those flows. So for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Darren Morgan, nursery manager at Shinars. I do a lot of these talks and such. And uh, I've been dry gardening here for a while. So I um, wanted to share some of my results. There's a lot of great information about dry farming, the larger scale application of this. Um, but I've noticed there's a kind of a lack in the homeowner applicable small garden stuff. So that's what I really wanted to address with this talk specifically. So what is dry gardening? Well, we're talking about growing vegetable crops without any supplemental irrigation, in other words, on natural rainfall patterns only. Um, I don't normally talk within this talk specifically about short season stuff that you, know, you get out like in, in 20 or 30 days and it's not really relevant about watering, especially if you're doing it early and late, or about winter and overwinter gardening, which obviously typically need very little irrigation because of the seasonality, those are strategies you will employ in terms of maximizing your yield without, without irrigation, but aren't really the crux of this talk specifically. It's important to keep in mind that dry gardening is not for every crop, not for every situation, and not for every location. So there's a limited number of applicable sites uh, where, where dry gardening can take place. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. Um, dry gardening requires very critical timing. A lot of times in the vegetable garden, you've got your seasonality of your crops and when they can be planted and when they can't, but you've got a pretty broad window. In the dry garden, you don't have that window. A classic example is uh, last year. I did not do a dry garden last year. I was unable to work my soil until way into June. And that really is too late to start the dry garden um, because you need to have those plants up to size and with roots down to the appropriate levels or it's not going to work. So with the transition last year, um, decided that was not a viable approach for my garden. Um, there are crops that work well. There are crops that don't. We'll talk about that in some depth. Um, bear in mind that even the people who are writing all these internet articles about this and doing the research, there's a reason they're still doing the research at places like OSU on, on dry farming. There's a lot of data we don't know and that needs to be developed experientially. So do feel free to play around besides uh, exactly what I tell you here today. There is some attention to technique um, that needs to be paid. Um, it's, it's not a lot different from traditional vegetable gardening. There's some specific things you can do that will make your dry gardening much more successful. And there are things you can do wrong that will re reduce your results. So the right side, what's the right side? Well, we'll speak a little broader than just our immediate location audience here. Climate matters you're not gonna do the same type of dry gardening in Arizona or Eastern Oregon or the gorge or even the coast. It's not gonna be quite the same as us. Generally speaking though, any climate that's not super, super severe, anything where we're not, um, not having a, a combination of extremely low humidity um, and very hot temperatures for extensive periods of time, um, most of these are manageable. Soil matters more than climate. Uh, we need soil that is naturally moisture retentive to dry garden. Some combination of clay and humus will develop that, uh, that moisture retention ability. Uh, this is one of the few advantages to doing a lot of gardening on clay. It holds water really well, and you can use that to your advantage for dry gardening. Really sandy soils don't, don't dry garden well. Soils that are excessively see is not as good as clay and humus, or clay, clay and silt and humus. Um, shallow soils, where you either have a very, like a small raised bed, shallow raised bed, or you have a shallow profile before you hit an impenetrable layer, like a rock layer. Uh, 
do not work well for dry gardening. Recording in progress. The dry gardening site must be relatively free from competition. Two main categories of competition that need to be addressed. Uh, first one is um, trees. So trees have really, really, really big root systems. And um, those roots, so if you look at a tree, if you look at the you know, 50 or 60 foot canopy of a tree, the roots are far beyond that. And those roots are competing for that same retentive soil moisture that your crops will be competing for. Um, the other one that doesn't get addressed as frequently is turf. The turf grass, like a lawn or a pasture, those grasses have fairly substantial root systems out beyond just the edges of where you actually see the turf. And they're notoriously effective at actually chasing down and, uh, and, and finding moisture uh, and, and making use of it. So of course, at that point, that is a, that is a problem for your crop plants. You do have to also allow adequate space because it takes a lot more space to dry garden a plant than it does in a well irrigated soil um, at two to three times the volumetric space. Also note that you really shouldn't intensively dry garden a given location year over year over year. You should allow some alternate year or fallowing periods. Uh, in my garden, I do that by splitting the garden in half and I do half of it unirrigated, the other half I irrigate and then year over year, I simply flip flop them. This gives me a year of active gardening with irrigation, a year of garden, active gardening on the dry garden. And that gives us a chance to rest and recuperate uh, from depletion of, especially biological depletion, because consistently dry gardening with no irrigation coming on over and over. And then you're also feeding and then taking crop plants and plant residues out, kind of strips the soil where an irrigated soil has a chance to recover at least some of that. Talked about at the beginning a little bit about timing. So timing is important. Um, you really have to get those plants in as early as is practical for the crop in question. Of course, that also means you're dealing with any crop residues, weeds, or cover crops on the soil. So you need to be looking at lead time. Um, if we're trying to get the garden in, in basically late April through mid-May window, that's your best window for a dry garden in Western Oregon. You're needing to incorporate any biological material that you're putting in, fresh compost, weed material, or cover crops uh, when you're working them in. You need to give yourself about two weeks of lead time because of allelopathy, the, the, the decompositional processes actually inhibit plant development for young plants. Um, so you need to be cutting that cover crop or, or, or controlling those weeds um, a week ahead of that. So you need to be looking at that 14 to 21 days ahead of uh, maybe at the latest mid to late May planting. You need to be cutting your cover crop, getting it started in decomposition, get it tilled in two weeks ahead of planting, let it finish its, its allelopathic period, uh, and then get it in by that period, which is why I stopped last year. Um, just was not practical by the time I was at, able to put a tiller on the, on the ground. Couldn't make it work anymore. So that being said, we're talking about tillability because you need to get that organic material that you're incorporating. And you'll want to incorporate plenty of organic material in unless you're already incredibly numacy um, to depth. Um, just working it in those top surface layers is not very effective. We really need to get it down. Now, in terms of no-till gardening and dry gardening, um, you can leave large swaths of it no-tilled, but where you're actually doing the planting, you can do it by hand rather than tiller, there's no problem, just the, the labor involved, but you need to do fairly substantial areas. Again, we're talking two to three times the normal spacings on plants at good depth. You need to be able to get that water that's come, still coming down in the spring down in there and held down in there and the plant roots need to be able to follow it down. 
So you can't just sh shallow surface incorporate or scuff in stuff. You really got to do a pretty thorough job of soil working at least in the planting hole itself. Of course, you still need to, to, to keep that in mind that we do have um, climate limitations. Our last frost free date is usually about May 15. A lot of things can go out before then, but like your, trop your more tropical stuff like tomatoes, peppers, um, squashes and melons. That's really a start of planting date. Normally is about May, May 15. Um, you can expand that with um, covers and other um, you know, soil, soil, soil heating, like putting black fabrics down to heat the soil or putting covers over the young plants to protect them, to give you that extra week or two. I don't normally do that in my tomato planting. Sometimes in the dry garden, I'll get a little more carried away with it uh, if we're on the bubble on a season. Um, the, the advantage in a regular garden isn't that great. The advantage in a dry garden is pretty significant. I have a question uh, from our online audience, how deep for organic material? And that does depend a bit on crop in question, but we're talking about working organic material in you know, 15 to 18 inches down into the soil. You need to be able to get down into it uh, at a fairly good depth. So we're gonna talk a little bit about crop selection. Uh, first group here, uh, stuff that's mostly pretty easy to dry garden without making radical modifications to how you're already growing them. Uh, tomatoes and squashes are really your number one and number two crops in terms of ability to dry garden in Western Oregon. Peppers have been pretty successful. Um, there's some trade-offs in, in yield. Potatoes the same, they, they're successful, but there's some trade-offs in yield. Um, melons and carrots with some caveats are all easy crops. Um, another question from online, what time would you recommend planting melons here? I plant melons after the 15th of May and before the 15th of June and in the dry garden. We're talking about usually mid to late May at the latest. So try to, try to hit that window. Mid-May is ideal if you can manage it. Um, so these crops are all fairly straightforward and we'll go through them one by one to give you a little more feel for how, how that looks. Tomatoes are a simple crop to dry garden. They're highly successful. The yield is almost as good in a dry garden situation as in an irrigating, irrigated garden situation. If you talk about overall poundage yield. Individual plants, individual fruits are slightly smaller but flavorable is quite noticeably better. Um, yield uh, is earlier. Um, they tend to, because of the stress loads of going through dry, they tend to actively try to ripen the crop instead of trying to put on more and more and more vine growth. Um, so it does tend to speed up the ripening process marginally, not hugely. An important note on tomatoes in dry gardening, and we'll have this with a couple of other crops as well. So tomatoes get blossom end blight. It's a rot on the bottom or flower end of the fruit, uh, and it's caused by calcium deficiency. It's not a disease, it's a physiological disorder, nutrient deficiency. So there's two factors to calcium availability. Is the calcium in the soil, and is it soluble in a form that the plants can actually absorb and make use of it? Well, our immediate area, there's basically no calcium to speak of in the soil. Um, some of the things you incorporate in like leaf masses and cover crops will add small amounts, but not much. Uh, normally we have to lime or provide other, other calcium sources for our tomato plants for good success. Normally we'll do that right at planting and I'll normally follow that up like mid July with a second, second handful or so of lime per plant just to make sure that I've got a steady supply of calcium going through the season. Well, the early application of lime seems to be just normally effective, but trying to reapply that in July in an unirrigated garden doesn't seem to do a whole lot of good. So I've taken in my dry gardening to really, really throwing the lime at the tomato plants. Even with really substantial liming processes, there's definitely an increase in blossom and blight in an unirrigated garden situation. That's something you want to pay attention to. <coughs> with, um, with oyster shells? Yes, so sources of calcium. <coughs> oyster shell and eggshell do provide calcium sources. Mm -hmm. um, calcium lime, calcium carbonate limes. Um, you'll find garden limes come in a couple of flavors. Um, there's 
dolomite limes and calcium or uh, typically calcium limes. Dolomite limes are 50% or more magnesium. They don't have that much calcium in them. They're great for changing pH. They're not great for providing calcium. Um, oyster shell and uh, eggshell, I find it hard to get enough in the soil um, at, a, at a reasonable expense anyway, to make it worthwhile in the vegetable garden. As, a, as an amendment in, like a, in a potting soil, sure, but I don't, I don't think I can get enough calcium that way. So I tend to focus on, on calcium carbonate. Right. I, I would just see, like, in my kitchen too. Yeah. Like, there are cats mm -hmm. and um, the oyster shell and NHL. Yeah. So maybe I mean, just years of it. Yeah, absolutely. So a, situ a situation like a, a, a chicken coop that's not, not being actively chickened now, um, you can plant into that. There's lots of nutrients in there. There's um, oyster shell in there from feeding and then eggshell in there too. And so there's likely to be some calcium in there. Um, you can do really formal analysis if you really get excited about it too and have somebody check to see what your soil calcium contents are. But um, for the most part, we use, we use calcium carbonate lime to make, to make that work. Mm -hmm. Uh, so provide lots and lots of calcium at planting, and with all of these crops, plenty of fertilizer at planting for the same reason. Supplemental fertilization later in the season is less effective, especially for organic nutrients. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, later. Uh, plant deep. So tomatoes are a, plant, are a crop that you can plant deep. You get them in the pot and they're yay long and you can strip off those bottom leaves and plant them way up the stem and then that stem develops more roots. And that's great in a regular garden, and that's really, really advantageous in the dry garden. So do that deep planting on them. Um, moderate size Continue on I south for three miles. Or, you know, indeterminate tomatoes are typically the best producers in a dry garden situation. The really, really big ones tend to have a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, blossom and blight. So do determinate varieties that try to ripen all the fruit essentially at once. Um, that's, that's a problem uh, because they're putting, uh, the, the calcium needs to get all the way out to the ripening fruit. Um, and when you've got the entire yield of the crop is all coming ripe at once, they're using all the available calcium. When the indeterminate varieties, they keep cycling through as, a, as the flower and, and fruit develops. Um, ones I've done at home that have been very successful, Sweet 100, Little Cherry Tomatoes, most of the cherry tomatoes do pretty well in the dry garden and they're really, really sweet. Uh, Fantastic is a fairly good sized slicer and I've had good success with that in the dry garden. Ultra early varieties um, like Stupus and Glacier have been very, very successful. I have grown with reasonable success in the dry garden. Um, several Roma types, including San Marzano's, uh, okay. Lemon Boys, Oregon Springs, when I say moderate success, we're seeing a substantial increase in blossom and blight on them and um, increase in yield over what I would naturally expect in the, um, in, in, in the irrigated garden situation. Um, ones I have not grown dry garden myself, but are in the literature as being successful dry garden varieties, pineapple, pineapple. Cherokee Ready. Purple and Early Girl uh, are, are widely we'll cited in dry farming. We'll be there when uh, we come back. Stay, 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 stay right there, Moosey. Stay right there, Moosey. We'll be right back. Can, can I ask that people please turn off their mics? There's discussions and stuff in the background that's really interrupting things. Yes, I uh, appreciate that. And of course, I've got my sound oh. down, so I'm having some problems with... Uh, with, uh, with monitoring that. I'm gonna kick some mutes on real quick and see if I can get everybody muted down. Apologize for my online audience there. Uh, let me know uh, on, the, on, the chat, on the chat bar if that's uh, it's, uh, continuing to be a problem. I'll, I'll, so I'll keep them on, uh, an eye out on it. Thank you. So squashes, if I had to pick a single crop to dry garden, it would be a summer squash. So I told you I split my garden every year and um, I usually put one zucchini in the dry garden, one in the irrigated garden. Year over year, I cannot tell the difference, plant size, fruit yield, between ones that are irrigated and ones that are not in my own garden. Um, so yes, I think in the grand scale, I do notice that the dry garden ones maybe finish out a little faster, age out a little earlier in the season. So maybe, uh, maybe by September, uh, I'm seeing a decrease by then. Um, does that really matter to you with zucchini? Are you, are you sick of zucchini by September? 
um, hardly noticeable difference in overall yield over time. Um, very, very good production, but a somewhat increased um, incidence of, of blossom and light. Not as dramatic as I'm seeing in the tomatoes, but it's definitely there. And, and of course, squashes and, and melons and cucumbers all have calcium deficiency issues as well. So watch that on your squashes. Now, plenty of calcium, plenty of fertilizer at planting. Um, there's a lot of debate on how best to grow certain crops. I am a strong advocate uh, of these types of crops, including in the dry garden, to direct sow rather than buying transplants. Transplants buy you a little bit of time, but sometimes at the expense of quite a bit of stress load on the plant. Um, and on plants that are not super time sensitive, um, I, I do find that direct seeding them makes a heck of a difference in overall success. So squashes are big plants anyway. And keep in mind the general guidelines, we've already stated two to three times the space. You need to allow lots and lots of room for summer and winter squashes in the dry garden. Um, so my personal experience with squash in the dry garden is specifically with summer squashes. I don't grow a lot of winter squashes at home, not because I don't like them, because I have family that grows lots of them and there seems little effort, little point to duplicating the effort when we always end up with more winter squash than we can go through before it goes bad. Um, literature suggests that the winter squashes do uh, equally well in the uh, in dry garden situations. Uh, but this has been my, my most successful overall crop in the dry garden. Yes, a question. What are you seeing zucchini if there's a calcium deficiency? Excellent question. So um, what do you see in zucchini with a calcium deficiency situation? So we're familiar with tomatoes with the blossom and bite. It's kind of the same, except the zucchinis often never develop out far enough for you to notice the this, this sequence. Um, when the zucchinis are actually quite small, um, they'll start developing the rot on the, on the blossom end, and it will rapidly rot out the whole thing. What you normally see is a whole batch of stunted black zucchinis that aren't, aren't developing at all with calcium deficiency. Peppers. One of the big things I noted in my first year of dry gardening was my bell peppers actually turned red. That's, that's a shock in Western Oregon because a lot of times they don't. We just don't have the heat development and long enough season for them to do that well for many, many varieties. It did speed up the ripening sequence noticeably. Um, yield was definitely smaller. There's a more noticeable reduction in yield with peppers than there is with tomatoes. And the fruit was smaller, but the quality was good and the cell walls were quite adequate for, for good use. Um, definitely some increase in blossom and blight. Pe peppers are nowhere near as sensitive to that as tomatoes and squashes, but it is there. Um, biggest thing I noted with my peppers was sun scald. They didn't leaf out very thickly, um, and that made a, the sun scald issues much more noticeable. So again, provide plenty of calcium and fertilization at, uh, at planting. Try to pinch them early in the season a little bit to encourage a denser, bushier habit to provide a little better leaf cover. Um, because uh, Sun Skull took out a big chunk of my first year's uh, dry garden peppers. They just they had such large patches, they weren't even harvestable out. Um, successful varieties are what you would expect for this area. Um, Carmen, Orange Blaze, Gypsy. Um, actually, since I put the slide together, I did do some Jimmy Nardellos and they were just great. Um, quick maturing varieties as usual. My cow wonders, which I often end up harvesting green at the end of the season, did red nicely. I was pretty happy with that. Uh, pretty much all of your hot peppers are quite suitable for dry gardening. And the literature suggests also that all of those elongate sweet peppers, all those Italian type sweet roasting peppers and such should do quite well in the dry garden as well. Potatoes. So clay makes great dry gardening situation. Clay is not the best for potato production. And I fought this in the irrigated garden as well. The heavy soil did definitely impact the, tomato, the potato yield in the dry garden. Um, and even beyond just the soil issues, 
both the overall yield per pound of seed potato planted and the size of the individual harvested um, potatoes were noticeably less. Um, it quite, quite substantial. That does not mean it's not worthwhile. Just bear in mind the effort and resources you're putting into it. Overall successful enough that I've done it year over year with, with good results. The key here is to plant early. Um, you notice that, that interesting sizing issue. Uh, potatoes are more um, notably cold tolerant than most of your other nightshades. And in fact, a lot of your other summer garden plants, um, you can be planting them well, maybe not this year, but potentially now, early April, mid-April uh, in Western Oregon with no problems. So when your soil is workable early, get them in early, you will be much happier with your overall results. Um, normally when we grow potatoes in the garden, we take one or two cycles of hilling up. So you plant your potatoes when they come up through the soil surface, you then bury all the topmost leaves and then they grow some more and you do that again. That increases your overall zone of roots which is where your tubers are produced and enhances your yield. Don't do that in the dry garden. It's gonna be hard for them to recover from that kind of hill. So take the slight decrease in yield over that. Um, earlier variety, the earlier you're, you're harvesting the varieties, the more overall successful you're gonna be with them in the dry garden. No surprises there. I haven't really been brave enough to dry garden any 120 day fingerlings. To be honest with you, I don't do a lot of really, really long cycle potato crops. I just don't have the patience for having potatoes in the ground for 100, 110, 120 days. I do a lot of 60, 80, 90 day varieties. They've been successful. Um, so varieties, I have not run into anything that has not worked and I have tried nine varieties now um, and they've all been reasonably successful. Um, I will eventually, sometimes some years I do do some fingerlings, I will eventually play with some fingerlings and see how they make it through the very dregs of the season uh, with no irrigation. Um, some thoughts on potatoes in the dry garden. If we take a step back in the slides for a moment, you notice I'm doing the mounding like I usually do, or a hilling uh, of, of, of potatoes. I've got all my potatoes in a, they're spaced, but they're in a mound. They're not laid out in rows. Um, it seems to me, quite reasonable to do the farming method of potato cultivation in the dry garden rather than the home garden. We'll mound them together in these mounds to increase our yield per square foot in the home garden. We can put a lot more potatoes in a given square footage that way, even though the yield per pound is not quite as good. Uh, on the farm, that they put these things out at individual chips planted like two feet apart with four to six feet between rows. Spacing them like that in the dry garden would probably give us overall better yield um, per pound planted, though I'm not sure I can afford that kind of space. Um, so that's the balancing act that, that goes uh, that goes uh, that goes into that. So melons. Melons are never the easiest crop in Western Oregon. I will say that they are certainly no harder to grow dry than they are irrigated. And in fact, my overall consistency of production has increased in the dry garden versus, uh, versus in the irrigated garden. Um, the individual melons are notably smaller, um, but the flavor is good and the yields have been quite reasonable anyway. So melons are hungry plants. One of the ways you are successful with melons in this climate is by giving them plenty of fertilizer. I appreciate fertilizer. Uh, the help um, Very, very, very well at planting weeds. Um, do remember to lime them. They're nowhere near as calcium sensitive as, as squashes and tomatoes, but they are calcium sensitive. And if there's not any in the soil, you will have a lot of um, melons that simply abort off that never try to develop out. Um, Direct sow from seed, it's just like with, with squashes, it really is the best way to handle them. I've done okay with watermelons. The reduction in fruit size was pretty darn significant though. Um, I've done much better with, uh, with cantaloupe type and honeydew type. So early dews, Athenas, pales, uh, hearts of gold, all the Charente type melons. For watermelons, I, I've never been very good with the little, little watermelons, uh, whether irrigated or not. I've done quite well with Crimson Sweets and Charleston Gray, my overall best watermelon for this area. 
um, thick rind, but worth it. Um, but the size came down pretty darn significantly. I mean, Charleston's in harvesting like this in the irrigated garden, and harvesting like this in the dry garden. Still lovely flavor, fun to do, but it was pretty noticeable, the, the decrease. Um, I will try some of the smaller fruited types because I haven't done a lot of that in the dry garden. I kind of gave up on them in the irrigated garden several years ago, but it's worth, worth playing with some of the smaller types and see if the reduction is not quite so dramatic. So carrots, the variable on carrots is gonna be the germination period. Carrots take forever to sprout, um, 21 plus days from seed to first green showing. And at that point, um, if you have a really sudden dry spell, you might have some issues. I, I'm always out there anyway at 24 days, throwing more seed out there, and then I go out the next day and, and see the first seed I find that finally came up day after I reseed every time. I just don't have the patience. Um, so really sh uh, sharply uh, swinging seasons might give you some problems getting good germination on them. Getting summer germination on carrots for a fall winter crop is gonna be pretty well impossible in a dry garden situation. There's not enough moisture on the soil surface for the carrots to germinate for later plants. And that's, that applies to a lot of what we would normally do as you know, winter gardening, fall gardening. Uh, don't do those in your dry garden part of your garden because you just can't get the plants going in July and August when you need to get them going for those seasons of harvest. Yield size was, yield, yield overall was good, not great, but good. Individual carrots were tremendously variable in size and how misshapen they were, but that's not uncommon again in my heavy soils to some extent anyway. Um, definitely thinning. Um, the first time I did the carrots in the dry garden, I didn't, thin, I thinned them normally and that was not enough. They, they ended up all very puny. So thin them much more aggressively. Overall successful and worth experimenting with more to fine tune it. Do work the soil very deeply for carrots. Don't get too much organic mass in there, but you have to have some and make sure organic mass with carrots that you're incorporating deeper into the soil is well decomposed. That's one of the big factors with carrots is fresher manures or composts really cause them to hair up and fork up badly. Plant as early as you can get away with. That's usually April here for carrots for direct sowing if your soil is at all workable, of course. Um, they take forever to germinate. I say that over and over, but it really frustrates me. Um, I've had the best success with uh, Danvers Half Long. It's a big wedgy thing that does well in my clay soils anyway, and a surprisingly good su success with sugar snacks. I've had okay results on Mokum and Bolero. They're two of my traditional carrots, and they're really normally short season carrots. I figured would be really good in the dry garden. They did okay. They didn't do exceptionally well. Um, so all of those Nantes types do tend to deform in my heavy clay soils. Anyway, my next plan for uh, new things to try is some Charentaise or Char from Chantonaise. Um, they should give me a little better, better uniformity, I think. Um, that's, that's my best guess in, in my clay soils. Um, the lack of irrigation does create some crummy, some, some chunkiness to the soils, which causes a little more deformity. You're always gonna be dealing with that, even with varieties that are doing all right. Okay, so those were our top crops for the dry gardening. We're going to talk a little bit about some crops that, were that we've had some success with, but are definitely more challenging or limited. Beans. This does not make much of the research on dry farming, except for dry shelling beans. Um, and, and frankly, getting dry shelling beans to, to dry in Western Oregon is pretty dicey anyway. So I was doing dry gardening. I was looking at the seed packages and the days to harvest. And you know what? 54 day beans, 60 day beans, even if we dry down, well, I should be able to get a crop off on those. So why not? So we put some in, you see them in the, in the mid ground center of the picture. There's a very short row of bush beans in my dry garden just to play with. Um, I got a good first harvest. I really expected I would given the, 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 the period, you know, when you're talking about a, a, plant, a crop you're planting in May and you're getting out in early July, maybe mid July at the very latest, there's still moisture. But we're not that dry yet. I was surprised, however, I left them in and my bush beans in the irrigated garden, they'll get a, get a harvest, I'll get a second flush, I'll get a second harvest. I usually don't manage three, I usually manage two. 
Um, surprisingly enough, they did flush out nicely at the end of the season. I got a decent um, August, September harvest on those, uh, on those bush beans for a second crop. So much better than I expected. I do not think there's any chance you will ever get whole beans dry gardened in Western Oregon. Too much mass, too much water demand. Uh, I would defer to anybody who's brave enough to try it, but I, um, I haven't bothered at this point. I just don't see the, the risk versus reward. But the bush beans did well. They were not as productive as in the irrigated garden, but they were all right. Um, despite their ability to nitrogen fix, like all legumes, do feed them well. It is critical, especially in the dry garden. Um, dry shelling bush beans is what all the literature is about in dry gardening, dry farming. Uh, anything you can grow in Western Oregon and actually dry enough to, to, to shell uh, will do great and probably better in the dry garden than in an irrigated situation. Um, I will continue to explore this. I haven't tried any really longer cycle bush beans. Uh, I haven't tried Romanos. There's plenty to play with that I haven't played with yet. Um, but I, I was encouraged by the amount of success I had with that in the, in the first, first go, couple of go arounds. Most leaf crops are too shallow rooted and require too much consistency of moisture to dry garden. There certainly are some exceptions and kale is an exception. Now, my preference in kale is lacinato, the big dinosaur kale, the big blue stuff you see in the foreground of the picture there. Um, and um, that made it easy because they are really a durable plant in the first place. I am interested in exploring with some more varieties, but this is really the kale we eat the most. So um, leaves were slightly smaller, yield was definitely smaller. Um, we're slightly tougher even by lots of auto kale standards. So um, do be aware of that when you're cooking with them. They need a little extra sauteing or steaming time before they're down to, a, down to texture. Um, but I was surprised at how well they, they actually did in the dry garden. And we'll talk about that um, in a couple of slides from now about how well they held up. Uh, many leaf crops don't do well over the hot part of the summer even when irrigated. Uh, they really are sensitive. They tend to either bitter out or bolt or have problems as the stresses come on. Um, even 109 degrees during that, uh, that heat sink we had two years ago, uh, the kale came through that just, just peachy. Uh, things to try. So most leaf crops are either crucifer leaf crops or sunflower family leaf crops and don't have really the capability of developing a lot of drought resistance. Chenopods uh, seem to me worth a shot. Now we know spinach, although it's a chenopod, doesn't hold up well under dry conditions, hot dry conditions, worth a darn. Chard is probably worth playing with. It is tough as nails in any case. The roots do naturally go down pretty deep, as I'm sure you've noticed, trying to yank them out of the garden at the end of the season. Um, They're capable of being a biennial crop where you plant them, you grow them through a season, through a winter, and then you finish harvesting them out before they bolt the next spring. So they have the capability of being uh, quite a long production crop. I've never actually put chard directly in the dry garden, but as I said, with my split garden, it's frequently one of the plants I put on the edges, the division points, and they have, so they're not getting as much irrigation as the irrigated garden. Um, that's where I put my onions and my, uh, and my garlic too, uh, because I want those to dry down in the, in the, in the, as we near harvest. Um, so something to look forward to play, playing with a little bit more. I think it's worth experimenting with I haven't actually done that in my garden at home yet. Okay, so sweet potatoes. First run through with these in the dry garden was 2021. Obviously I didn't dry garden in 2022. So we're getting back to it again this year. Uh, provided the weather changes, this has not been a, a fun late winter, early spring. Um, I obtained what I would call proof of concept. I planted a sweet potato at the appropriate sweet potato planting time in early June in the dry garden, in the middle of the dry garden, well away from the irrigation. Um, I did actually get tubers off of it that I ate. So normal sweet potatoes, you put a slip in and you yield, and everything works well, 10 to 15 pounds of sweet potato tubers per plant, right? I got 2.5 pounds out of the dry garden one, but we were 109 degrees two weeks after I planted that poor plant. So yeah, um, we'll, we'll take that with a grain of salt and continue ex experimenting. The fact that it worked at all that year was, was, uh, was justification to keep, keep playing with it. 
Um, you need to find the balance point between getting them out when the soil is warm, but early enough that we still have some rain coming in for them to establish. Uh, end of May, first week, last week of May or first week of June seems to be the sweet, the sweet spot for sweet potatoes in my garden. Uh, I, can say, I mean, last year, all irrigated, I harvested 45 pounds of sweet potatoes. It's, it's very, it could be a very successful crop here. Any variety that you can grow here will work in the dry garden, um, but looking for 90, 95 day varieties, there's a lot of the varieties that you're used to finding in the grocery store that they don't grow around here. We don't have the right weather for them. Um, it's still an experimental thing for me. I don't see a lot of literature on dry gardening sweet potatoes, no surprise there. Um, I will be continuing to move forward, but proof of concept, we did make it through on one of the most vicious summers we've had and actually got at least a small yield. So I don't do corn in the dry garden because my dry garden, though it's big for the size of property it is, is on a little lot in town. Okay, I, I've got just, just several hundred square feet, you know, I think it's 1,500 square feet now of, of vegetable garden. Doing corn at the spacing it is required for dry gardening does not seem a good use of that space. Um, there's a lot of well-documented research on growing dent corn, corn meal corn dry corn uh, in dry gardening, dry farming situations. Um, and uh, following up on that, I would expect the same kind of thing I was expecting out of my green beans. If you got a variety that's gonna be mature in 65 days, your odds of that actually making it in here, around here are pretty darn good. We typically do have some moisture through June and, in, and into early July. Um, because it is important to get the wind pollination of the blocks, you're going to have to do square blocks or rectangular blocks. You can't just scatter them widely through the, through the, through the dry garden because there's just too much gap in between for good pollination. Um, do allow plenty of spacing, um, but it's worth playing with. Maybe if I expand the garden a little bit, I might get, get more adventuresome, but at this point, I just can't justify the space. So those are your basic crops for dry gardening. I would urge you to kind of expand and explore beyond that a little bit. Um, let's talk about how this works, how, how we can bring it all together. So um, timing is definitely the most critical thing I want to drill in over and over again. You, if you are not in the garden, you know, in the ground by say the end, uh, second, second week of June, it's not probably worth trying to dry garden that year. Um, the timing, they just don't have the time to develop down. The planting techniques, to make this more effective are a little bit different from what you would normally do in planting your plants, but they're not hugely complicated. So get as early a start as practical, prepare your planting area, whether it's the whole garden or whether it's plant by plant planting areas and get in plenty of organic mass at good depth, which is usually more than you can do with your tiller anyway, you're gonna do some hand work in there uh, and, and get it all ready ahead of time. Dig, or, big, dig deeper holes and bigger holes. Uh, normally here we say broad holes and don't worry about soil depth. In this case, you do have to get the depth down. Allow approximately double the space. Um, so like tomatoes in my irrigated garden are about four feet apart, barely enough room to walk between. And, and tomatoes in my dry garden run eight to nine feet apart. I've done them as tight as six, but I felt the yield was impacted. So allow plenty of space. Time, if you're starting your own seed from, for, for planting, you've got to get your timing down. Um, you know, tomatoes are between six and eight weeks to transplant, could be held on and sized up a bit. Um, you can't be too far off if you're off by a couple of weeks, it may be a disaster. I do prefer direct sowing larger seeded plants like squashes, melons, beans. In the dry garden, do pre-soak them at least briefly, enough to swell the seed. I don't always do that in the irrigated garden, but it will speed up your germination. Then whether you're starting from seed or whether you're transplanting, muck in your, uh, your, your plantings. So this is the only time I will add water to my dry garden. And at planting, I'll prepare the planting site, I'll plant the seeds on top, get the seed cover to the appropriate depth, and then I will pour water onto that to set slowly, gently to saturate the soil. I'll take two hands and we'll press down firmly, not abruptly, but firmly uh, four positions to get up to compress that soil down. So what we're doing with that is we're making the soil very hydrated, very saturated with water. 
And then when we press down, we're pushing that water down into the lower layer levels of the soil and we're creating these little channels. And the roots of those plants are gonna follow those little channels down to the water deeper in the soil. And you can do the same thing when you're planting a transplant, get your planting to the normal finished planting point, saturate the hole, push down to, to compress the soil around those, those planting areas. It is really, really important to fertilize thoroughly at planting um, because there's, uh, there's not much chance to do so later. So be organic, be not organic, but you really shouldn't be throwing non-organic fertilizers in the dry garden. Non-organic synthetic fertilizers are salts. They're going to they're going to increase the water demand stresses of a plant. Organic fertilizers are the order of the day: manures and or granular organic fertilizers. The caveat to that, of course, is that organic fertilizers require soil microbial activity to break them down into forms the plants can use. And as that soil gets increasingly dry through the season, that seems to decrease the the speed of reaction there and how fast those nutrients become available. So follow up feedings later in the summer are not as effective as getting that plant growth out early in the season under plenty of nutrient supply. Mulching at planting and sometimes again later into the season is very valuable for dry gardening. You can use artificial mulches, um, you can bring in composts or you can bring in fabrics to create your, your, your mulches, your protections. Um, a valuable technique that's used widely in dry farming and, and translates really well to the dry garden is to do a crumb mulch or a dust mulch, where you actually take your you take a hoe or rake and you break up the soil outside of the planting area, the native soil a little bit into nice fine crumb, doesn't have to be dust, in fact, better if it's not dust. And then you rake that material over the planting area to cover the root zone. And you can do that as you're going through weed controlling through the season. You hoe up the little baby weeds as they're coming up and just rake that crumb and all, and all the little plant debris with it. Just rake it all up as a mulch around that soil. What you're doing is you're creating a transition zone where you've got wet soil, drier soil, crumb layer, and then air. And you're making it just harder for the, all that low water to evaporate up into the air. That's, that's the biggest goal there. Um, Really important that you do keep these areas well weeded uh, at the early parts of the season. The good news is by the end of July, first part of August, you're not gonna see a lot of weeds sprouting in the dry garden because it's not getting any irrigation. So if you keep it well controlled for the first half of the garden season, your labor goes way down in the second half of the season. So um, question on the, on the online chat, uh, is it bad to introduce some water later in the season? So, the goal to this talk is truly dry garden, unirrigated gardening. But, and I'll, I'll mention this again at the end, if you take nothing else away from this, take in mind that you don't probably have to water as much as you already are, even if you're not going all the way to a dry garden. Um, so use your judgment. Um, I, 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 I did a, play, I started really playing with this heavily early in COVID. And with the grocery store shortages and everything, and my wife was not thrilled that I was dedicating a lot of our arable land to experimental dry gardening um, and was asked if we, what if things come wrong? Are we going to water? No. <laughs> it's an experiment. We'll make money on it. It's fine. Uh, so uh, we did not. I have not supplemental watered anything in my dry gardens, and we have been successful. So um it's not a it's not a disaster. It's it's a, a judgment call on your part. Do you want to introduce some water late in the season to your dry garden? The goal is not to, but if it's a difference between success and failure on a particularly rough crop or a rough year, go for it. Um, the other question uh, on chat is about can you dry garden in raised beds? I'm going to hold that off for just a moment and talk about it at the end after we get through this section. It's challenging. It's not impossible, but it is challenging. So. My personal experience uh, with doing this, Corvallis, south, uh, out northeast, way clay soils, very heavy clay soils. It's, a, it's very well amended. I've been gardening in it actively for over 25 years in that specific location. So it's well-developed vegetable garden. Um, the dry and the irrigated gardens in, in, my, in my, my larger vegetable garden are adjacent. This means for sure water moves, okay? 
I am sure that when you get down there at 18 inches, that especially on the edges of the dry garden, there is some leach of moisture through. I can guarantee it. Um, you, you don't, it's not that isolated. You don't have these big impermeable barriers driven in. Um, so take that with a, as a caveat to this talk uh, that it mine's not perfectly isolated. I'm not out there in a big, big pasture clearing a space and planting individual plants in a, in a completely open area. I do rotate my dry and wet gardens annually to maintain my soil biology, and I use strictly organic pesticides, soil amendments, and, uh, and fertilizers. Dry, this is where I wanted to just put that question off. Dry gardening in raised beds is not impossible, but it adds some serious complications. The first thing is actual soil depth. If you have a dry a raised bed that is situated on top of native soil and you don't have any barriers between where you can actually work down into the native soil, you can theoretically dry garden raised beds. I've seen it done, okay? There are complications. Um, even in a situation where you have good access to a native soil underneath, you lose more water in a raised bed. There's just more transition zones and more, more interfaces where water gets lost. Um, bigger the raised bed, the better. The deeper the raised bed, the better. The more access you have to native soil, the better. Um, straight raised beds with barriers that don't allow any access to native soil are probably not going to work for any form of dry gardening, um, even if you're bringing in native soils to fill them rather than, uh, rather than building uh, artificial soil masses. Um, it's just you don't have the space, the, the actual water holding capability there. So um, that's, that's the challenge with raised beds. Certainly not impossible, but there's definite limitations. Combining this uh, summer dry gardening with off-season gardening in, in the irrigated areas in the fall and winter can really dramatically decrease the amount of water inputs you, you put into production, producing produce, okay? Um, which, but as I mentioned earlier, getting those fall and winter crops going is going to require an irrigated situation for them specifically. You're just not going to be able to establish them in July and August without the irrigation. So combining strategies or combining areas where you have areas that are dry, areas that are, that are, that are irrigated, um, are, are hugely advantageous ways to take, to, to utilize this information. Um, a good example is we see this quite a bit in more, uh, more rural gardens. Well, I've got water so far out. Beyond that, I don't garden because there's no water. Well, there's still things you can grow without water out beyond your, your irrigated vegetable garden when you have the space uh, and make use of that space instead of letting it just be, be waste space or fallow. Even if you don't go all the way to truly dry gardening, you really don't need to water as much as most people water their garden. Uh, and this is a chronic thing we see in ornamental gardening too, but if you water thoroughly at watering um, and let it soak in well, you shouldn't be watering every day, even in 100 degree weather. Uh, very, certain crops aside, there are definitely exceptions. You really should be able to get by with quite a bit less. So spacing, let's talk about how this goes together. Uh, on the right, you see my irrigated garden. I'm actually standing on the dividing line, pivoting for these pictures. So there's my irrigated garden on the right, a dry garden on the left. Now, I pack my irrigated garden, as you can see. I, I, my, my wife hates it because you can't walk through there to maintain or harvest or anything. Uh, but it maximizes my yield per square foot. The dry garden, not so much. You do really have to allow substantial amounts of space uh, for, for this to work at all. Uh, some pictures in 2020, um, and so what we've got here is you're looking at uh, on the left-hand picture there, um, looking down on a, on a melon patch and a row of bush beans, and then back towards uh, tomatoes and kale. And then you see between the tomato and the kale, you got that little black line that's a that's a sprinkler riser that's facing the other way. So that shows the the breakdown of, of, of my irrigation versus unirrigated garden. So looking back on the pole beans, the pole beans are getting water. The second uh, the cucumber over there on the other side of that stick is getting getting irrigated. Um, the topmost picture there is melons in August of 2020 with not one drop of additional water since initial planting. And uh, the bottom picture, same same time, just looking at the at the larger dry garden. Um, zucchini there on the on the, le on the you know, left hand side of that picture, and you know, three and a half feet tall, 
with uh, and clear. I mean, there's no way that's getting any water. That's that's 30, 40 feet from from the wet the irrigated side of the garden at all. Uh, so definitely dry and definitely performing very well. Here was my my clincher. <laughs> June of 2021, 3.30 p.m., 109 degrees by my thermometer. Went home early. We watered the plants and just closed up the shop. There was just no point in anybody being out in that kind of weather. This is my poor kale, uh, which had been planted in right, mid-May, right? So the topmost leaves came over and they did this. They, cur they completely curled over the top of the, of the kale plant. And then four days later, that heat dome broke, things unfurled. There's this perfect straight line from where it, where it crimped and everything towards the tip end of that leaf was burned. Rest of the leaf was fine. Everything underneath that leaf was fine. Those kale continued to develop and produce kale for, through the summer and then fall and winter with no supplemental irrigation, despite that stressful Potatoes hated that. So when you know timing matters, uh, and timing matters just about other occurrences just as much as it does about planting. The good news is that the potatoes were up and growing, but they were not, they had not started tuber formation yet. They hadn't flowered. Highest water demand for, for a potato plant is at flowering at the beginning of, of tuber formation. Um, if these had been at that point, I don't know that they'd have made it at that point. You know, had three days of that, basically. Uh, the leaves curled. We had a lot of wilt. Um, some of those were laying almost on the ground by the end of it. But they did, when the weather modified, did perk back up. Yes, yield was notably impacted, more so than previous experiences. But they did still produce potatoes after that. Again, 109 degrees in June. Uh, every the, the, poor, the poor zucchini back there is just... Just, just slumped down, recovered, developed normally, it had no adverse effects from that very hot span that very early season. Again, you can see the line, you got the, the uh, garlic plants back there in the background and there, um, that's, the, that's the irrigated versus unirrigated line in that, in that garden. So, you know, you don't have to be all one way or the other. I got to do my split garden because there's definitely things I want to grow that cannot be dry gardened. And because with my finite space, if I use all of it for dry gardening, it would substantially reduce my overall yield. We do kind of live on what I grow in the vegetable garden. We don't buy a lot of produce. Um, but you can you can play with that. You can do some supplemental irrigation if you feel the need, but you can also go completely dry if you choose, at least on certain crops. Do feel free to explore and experiment and share this information. It's, it, this is going to be an increasingly relevant topic. We don't think about it as much here in the wet side of the Pacific Northwest, but it's changing and it's going to change. And even if it doesn't change as much here, it's changing everywhere else and people are going to be moving and water demand is going to be a thing. So think ahead, plan for these things, share this information, get people used to it. Go beyond the ordinary. I, I mean, on the right hand side there, just for greens, I threw a couple of herb plants into the unirrigated garden. And cilantro, I got one little cilantro harvest, and then a great crop of coriander seed because it bolted really fast. The basil did not tolerate that worth a dollar. It just shriveled to nothing in, in almost no time at all. So that's what I had for a prepared presentation for you. And I would entertain any additional questions at this time from live. Yeah. Minimal pesticide use. Question was, what pesticides do I use? As little as I possibly can. My dominant use of pesticides is for insect control, for beetles mostly, and I use neem. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, very effective. Neem also has some mild fungicidal properties, so it has some use if you're getting some mild cases of mildew. There are some alternative organic fungicides, uh, mostly the bacterial fungicides. Um, we've got Monterey Complete Disease Control on the shelf now, but there are bacterial fungicides. For insect control, neem and pyrethrin are my, my, my go-tos. Um, I don't do a lot though. It's pretty, pretty minimal. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Um, two things on putting the small wheat plants back into the soil. Right. We don't have them in the Right. So the question is incorporating small weed plants back into the soil, uh, back in the soil, using them as mulch, um, mm -hmm. do we have a problem with them re-sprouting? If you are 
out there regularly and on top of it so that they are still small when you hoe them up. You will always get some until they won't run out of energy from the root mass where you dug them, where you chopped them. But the ones that are the tops on the ground shouldn't re-sprout. There are certainly exceptions. If you're dealing with horsetail, you get all bets are off. You're dealing with, with, with some, of the, some of the challenging stuff like that. Um, you keep on top of it for, for a couple of weeks in the early season, it's about four weeks early season. Um, it tapers off pretty fast. And as long as you're not getting them up to seed age, you shouldn't be getting a lot of coming back from the debris left in the soil, ideally. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, um, I just went by, I was walking by the fairgrounds last year and their gardens there, aren't those, aren't there dry beds, aren't those raised beds that they have? Yeah, absolutely, that's what I said, I've seen them do that. So the question was at the fairgrounds, the master gardeners have a dry garden exhibit in raised beds. They do have, um, they just, as, there's native soil under there, that's not a paved area. So they are down into it. I'm not sure how deep. I need to chat with them in a little more detail about what they're playing with out there. You can dry garden raised beds. It just has challenges. And uh, they use, I remember it, didn't they use straw? Yes, and so they, uh, at that garden, they, they, use, they brought in mulches. You can use compost mulches. They used straw at least one year. I don't, I'm not sure when you went through. Last year. Yeah, um, which can certainly be used as mulches. There are some caveats to bringing in lots of non-dust mulch, you know, non-crumb soil mulches. Those caveats are, number one, are you bringing in weed seed? Uh, with straw, that's a big issue. And granted, in the dry garden, that may be a decreasing issue over time. Secondarily, or, um, so carbonaceous materials, whether that's dried leaves or straw, are nitrogen negative. So they're sitting there on the soil on your interface um, and the microbes that are there in the soil, even though they're decreasing in activity as the soil gets drier and drier, are trying to break down the lignans in that, in that material. And to do that, they take nitrogen. They take nitrogen out of the soil. So substantial mulching with brought in materials like that, I generally advise against doing unless you are feeding very heavily. Um, but is it functional? Sure, you put, it, put an extra, extra layer of fertilizer down before you put the mulch down, and yes. In a raised bed, you really can't crumb mulch. There's not enough soil mass. I also noted that they planted a heck of a lot closer together in, the, in their experimental dry gardens than I'm doing in mine. Um, I, haven't been, I haven't been brave enough to, uh, to, to, uh, to explore that uh, too much in mine, uh, but they are, and they're, they're also an excellent um, additional resource for more information on dry gardening because they're doing this very actively. Um, OSU has quite a dry garden, dry farm research program out there on Oak Creek. And uh, I know that uh, Chemeketa Community College has also been involved with them on some of these projects. So uh, it's being increasingly discussed and there's a lot more people than me talking about it. So get some variety of opinions and, and then play with it. Try it and tell me what works. Yes. Um, if you use a, like a mixed organic fertilizer, like here, it has calcium in it. Mm -hmm. You still need to add more calcium. Yeah. So the question was, um, with uh, pre-mixed organic granular fertilizers, they have some calcium in them. Do you still need to add more? Generally, yes. They're getting the calcium from bone meal primarily. Um, it's a secondary aspect. They're using the bone meal primarily for phosphorus. There's not really enough calcium in there under a demand load. I mean, for for general purposes, for for, for many plants, just fine. But in terms of your high calcium demand plants like squashes, uh, cucumbers in, in, in the irrigated garden, you can't dry garden cucumbers, I'm sorry. I have tried a couple of times and they just collapse. Um, tomatoes, those tomato squashes, those kinds of plants, they really need a lot more than is gonna be in that fertilizer. Yes, I supplement pretty heavily, in, 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 even, even in the irrigated side, yeah. Uh, question? If you're direct sowing in a gloves or in bikini, at what point, you stop watering those little seeds. So the question was, when you direct plant the seed in the ground for squashes, melons, plants like that, at what point do you stop watering? I water them exactly once, mm -hmm. right? They're much faster germinating than, uh, than carrots, for example. You'll normally see some germination in, in a few days. Roots will start tapering down following the moisture trail. I have not, at this to this point, failed in a year of dry garden by direct sowing and watering them once. Uh, I suppose if we had a sudden heat and dry streak 
when the plants were super young. 109 degrees in June, I, they direct, I direct sowed in, in the second week of May that year, if I remember correctly. Those plants were, well, you saw, you saw how big that zucchini was. That was from direct seeded uh, in May. They, they grow pretty fast <laughs> once, they, once they get out. So. Mm -hmm. Other questions, audience here or audience at home? All right. Thank you very much for attending. I appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to hearing back from you on, on any successes you have with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.